Hey, and welcome to The Wendy Cooper Show. That's right, The Wendy Cooper Show, formerly known as Generation Jones Too Young to Be Old podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Cooper, and I hope you enjoy conversations with remarkable people over 50 just as much as I do. I consider myself a remarkable person over 50. I'm actually 63. So my goal is to build a community of like-minded people who are finding ways to celebrate today's pro-aging culture by coming together to stop ageism in our society. It's time to speak up, come out of hiding, and share our wisdom while embracing our age. We are living longer, and as the first segment of the population to feel the pinch of ageism due to longer lives, it is somewhat our responsibility to be loud and proud. So all generations to come will live long and thrive. I hope you enjoy the show. Today, my guest is Juliet Watt. You can find Juliet at julietwatt.com, where you can also find her TED Talk on compassion fatigue and second half of life reinvention. Juliet's life started in London, England, but New York was where she became an award-winning daytime soap opera writer. In her early 40s, she changed course in her career and became an ATP pilot and certified master instructor. After saving 6,000 animals in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and years of her life as a humanitarian taking care of others, Juliet moved to the mountains of Colorado, where she now spends her time with her horses, husband, and coaches people dealing with compassion fatigue. Juliet, welcome. Oh, hi, Wendy. Yes, thank you very much for having me. I am so happy that I am doing this show with you because... Not only, I I talk about it in my other shows, that every time I have a guest on, I always do a pre-interview or pre-conversation. So I get to I, I get to see if we, you know, have have any right. type of synergy and if you're going to like me, right. I'm going to like you. And and our conversation lasted an I know. hour and a half. That was wild, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did last. Yes. And I, I have to say, Juliet, you cracked me up because it's like, okay, so everyone listening, Juliet was referred to me through someone that I don't even know, but that's the power, I guess, of Facebook and social media. And there's these podcasting groups that are out there. And so this so this uh, young man, Jeremy, suggested that I have Juliet on the show. So I looked Juliet up and she's got this wonderful, you know, just this uh, first, she did a, uh, a TED talk, talk in Fargo, okay? And this is what I see first. And, and I am like such a lover of TED Talks, Juliet, that this is like my goal in life is to do a TED Talk. Um, that, of course, first I have to watch that. And you're such a, mm. your presence on stage is so normal, okay? Right. That's what that's what uh, attracted me to you. Your presence on stage mm. was so normal. And I thought, and you're speaking on compassionate Fatigue, compassion, right? Compassion, compassion, fatigue. fatigue. Yes. yes, and um, and that to me that was just like, what is the? You know, I just what is this? And then I listened to your TED talk, and then I said, okay, that's it. I'm I'm having you on the show, but but when I talked to you, I could tell you were like, nah, you know, Jeremy called you, or I contacted you, just like, do I really want to do this podcast? And an hour and a half later, I yeah. think we decided that yes, that was what you were going to do. <laughs> Yes, well, I'm I'm British, and we're known for we're known for a somewhat slightly hostile entry. So, so um, let's let's start with <clears throat> enlightening uh, our audience with what is compassion fatigue. Well, compassion fatigue, it, the actual um, definition of it, which came from Dr. Charles Figley, um, is the emotional and physical burden of that is created by caring for others in distress. That's the official um, explanation of it. That's the official quote of it. And primarily, Dr. Figley had um, created this because he was studying nurses and carers of soldiers with PTSD. And he was noticing that the, um, the carers uh, were becoming and having the same symptoms as their patients, even though they had not been through the trauma of war or anything like that. So he then went on to talk to firefighters, nurses, ER, paramedics. I mean, all the people, as I say in the talk, that are in the business of caring. <clears throat> so does that include that? So 
So those are those are people that have um, chosen a profession in life, like that's feel and probably felt as though that's their purpose in life is to serve others and to do so through being a first responder, a nurse, a doctor, a professional. Um, but that that it, it really it really just goes t- to everyone that becomes a caregiver or not even just a caregiver. To, to anyone in life. Yeah, that's what I discovered uh, in in looking at all the uh, in looking at all the symptoms. I said, well, that's rather strange because I've got them, and uh, I've never been any of the above. You know, I've never been a firefighter or, or carer really of any kind, um, except for dogs. I do look after my dogs, but uh, so I called Dr. Figley, and then as we were talking, he uh, he asked me about my mother, and I told him the whole thing. And and um, you know, professors are very eminent people that don't dramatize anything and they don't, you know, laugh and giggle. I mean, they're very, very serious. And he was very serious when he said to me, do you realize the trauma you've been through and are still in? He said, you have a form of PTSD that is an emotional PTSD. And we went on to have an hour and a half conversation about that. It was absolutely fascinating. So then I got to thinking, well, gosh, how many people out there are in a position where they are caring for someone? And this can be from your elderly parent to your husband who's had a stroke to your 27-year-old child who's addicted to drugs that you cannot throw out. I mean, the whole gamut of caring in the general population. And as I dug into my research, I found there's 108 million odd people caring for someone at one time or another. And that's just in this country, going through compassion fatigue without knowing it. And if you don't recognize it, the other side of it is burnout, which is just darn scary. How is compassion fatigue uh, typically diagnosed? One and number two, is it misdiagnosed for depression and and anxiety? Uh, I would yes, assume. Yes, it is, and that's and that's the sort of the that's the underbelly of it. I mean, it, 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 you, it's not an illness. I mean, when you have depression, when you have clinical depression, you actually have a malfunction in your brain. You have a condition that is treatable. Compassion fatigue is not an illness. It's not even a condition. It's a state that you're in. You're in a state of caring that has become beyond what you personally have the resources for inside. You've given up everything. So you don't even notice these symptoms, you know, but you're irritable. You're fatigued. Um, you start, and and this is what happens as as it gets worse and worse and worse. You start to not care about who you're caring for. You start to to really have a resentment about it, and um, and so as the journey progresses into burnout, burnout, um, suicide, drugs, becoming an alcoholic. I mean, the that side of burnout is quite scary. And the problem is when you have the general public, when you have you and me going through this, first of all, we go to the doctor and we go, listen, I feel this, I feel fatigued. I'm in a bad mood. I can't. And they go, well, you've got maybe depression. So they give you antidepressives, which actually makes the whole thing worse because you don't, your body is not needing serotonin. So, so now you're feeling actually worse because everybody knows the, you know, depression, depression medication can actually make you feel depressed if it doesn't agree with you. Yeah. So give everybody kind of a little concept of what we're talking about. I'll read, I'm going to read from your website, um, some of the symptoms or some of the feelings that people might have. And so this is, this is your typical, if you're feeling any of these, hey, wake up. So here they are. So obviously, uh, you know, are you feeling constantly anxious and overwhelmed? Has your life become physically and emotionally exhausting? Have you lost yourself in, in who you've been for everyone else? If you're saying yes to any of those questions, you may be dealing with compassion fatigue and don't even know it. There's others. Are you trapped in a negative work or personal situation? Are you constantly trying to keep things positive in the workplace? You don't know who you are anymore. That's a really big one, I think, for people that are getting over 50, which is our target market, you know, or you experience unusually strong reaction to a minor event which feels traumatic to you. That sounds, to me, that kind of sounds like the typical things of when people think they're they're anxious or they're too stressed or they're, you know, they react to a horn blowing and it's like, ah, you know, the world's caving in. Or job or whatever job you're in, maybe you're in your own business. Then you come home. Now you've got to rethink and you've got to be a parent. 
and 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 you've got to do home life and you've got to cook dinner and you've got to do the laundry and you've got to take the kids to all the things they need to go to. Then you go to bed at whatever time, you get up and do it all over again the next day. And all of a sudden, you're almost in a trance because everything everything that makes you who you are has been stuffed down because of who you're being for everybody else. And and it's so easy to do. Ye- yes. So I found myself, now I'm going to be very honest, I found myself, we talked about this, and you and you really made me realize something uh, in, our, in our phone conversation that was like such an epiphany for me. I mean, it was really remarkable. Um, I was in a situation uh, 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 not too long ago, and I, w- I was taking care of someone, I was sharing that care of somebody that was very close to me, <laughs> and and I, I said to you, and it resulted in me, I haven't seen this person now for almost a, over, well over a year, a uh, very close member of my family, and, um, and you made me realize that I thought she, I was talking to you about her having compassion fatigue. That's what I thought happened to her. And so she connected, disconnected from everyone and blah, blah, blah. And she was going through all of these things. And you made me realize that, you, you made me realize that, but was it me that I had compassion fatigue? Because I didn't disconnect from anybody, but I sure started to resent her and, and that she was like using me almost. I mean, can you explain that to people? It was so fascinating. To yes. Me. And I can, I, it's, it's, um, it, without sounding cruel and mean, um, saying it in a literal sense, it's sort of a manipulation because when someone is in pain, is in emotional pain and because they feel worthless and they feel all those negative feelings about themselves. Usually they will reach out to anything and everyone around them in order to try and make themselves feel better, feel more powerful, feel like they're in control. I can pick up the phone and my sister, my brother, my friend will come running. And in that, that is a false sense of validation. They feel validated because they can pick up the phone, they can, and, and when, and just to make sure that the person understands that they are needy, they'll become ill. They'll tell you they're ill. They'll tell you they've fallen down. They'll tell you that, well, they can't do this because, I mean, they are very much in the yes, but I can't because. So they have this myriad of excuses and they have a tremendous energy in all this as they're keeping you all in. And there's a very it's it's very deep, it's very subconscious, and they would be livid if you told them, but there's a sense of power that they feel, which is completely false because it's illogical and it's self-created. And and so in that pain, they are feeling this false sense of validation. These people come whenever I want them to. This person will look after me. They'll They'll cancel their vacation to be with me. And it's a manipulation. And my mother used to call me frequently every weekend with some dire thing that was wrong with her. And I was 4,000 miles away, thank God. But I mean, I used to try and tell her, well, go out and take a walk. No, I can't do that because, because, you know, I've got that hip problem. So my mother managed to manifest everything that she said was wrong with her, which wasn't wrong with her. And she then, this is the creepiness of it, she then got all those things. She said, I can't walk. And she got edema of the legs and couldn't walk. So a lot of people are going through this in their need to take care. They fail to see what the other person is really doing and that no matter what they do, it'll never be enough. No matter how much time they give them, it'll never be enough. And I think it it, it was kind of to the point where it's... um you can only do so much, right? You feel, I I felt as the person who was in the caregiver category, and I was in no mood or place in my life to be caring for anybody, um, that, uh, that I felt as though the other person never respected how I, didn't really respect how I felt about the whole situation. (laughs) They didn't, it wasn't that they didn't respect it. They actually didn't care because their needs came first. Their survival came first. And I'm saying you, one, we, we put their survival ahead of our own. It's, it's a very typical syndrome that happens. 
And, and and then and then you feel guilty. I felt guilty when you know I remember the very last day I saw this person, and I and I still in a weird way feel guilty. But but I had kind of hit the roof, right? I had hit I had hit my tipping point of nothing I can do for you is going to change how you feel. So why am I even here trying to do? anything and massive kudos to you for seeing that because now if you imagine if you hadn't seen that and you kept going you would then be going into rage and anger you would be going into resentment and finally you would move into almost a self-destructive state because that's burnout and and it, it's and, and it's yeah. and the and the further thing you made me realize is because um this person has not only disconnected from me she's disconnected from everyone in the family and uh and I think that that's sad, but you made me realize that it's just another way of her actually getting attention. <laughs> it was a very strange situation for me. Does that make does that yes. make sense, Wendy? Yes. Does that make and, sense? And yeah. and it so connects. Like I can't really disclose a lo- much more than I have. And um, but and anybody that knows me knows who I'm pro- who I'm talking about. But it's. It, it, it's it's rather almost disturbing to think that that's almost like a kindness for weaknessing. You know, people are are you know misinterpreting kindness for a weakness, and then and then the person you know because what is life unless we have compassion for others? This is very important part of life. You bet. Now she's sitting there going, hmm, okay, everybody's staying away. Now what can I do? I know I'll fall down and hurt myself, and they do. Uh, or th- there will be in the near future some crisis that somebody has to go there. And, and and we can't blame these folk because they're in pain. We have to, that's the way we ourselves can yeah. cope with this. One of the first things is to try and look at them with <sighs> gratitude that they are showing you who you are in that moment and that you can change and you can stop doing this. And in that gratitude comes compassion. Not that you're going to do any more for them, not that you're going to carry on doing what you're doing, but you're not angry, angry, angry every day at what this person is supposedly, and I say this in quotes, making you do. So, yeah. And the problem is when it's when it's someone very close to you, you know, it's usually in the family. and It's very hard because you have this, especially if it's a parent, you have this really false sense of duty. How do you we, how do you do that? How do you say no to the Um it's very difficult, Wendy. I'm not going to I'm not going to uh say it's anything but probably the hardest thing you'll ever do is when that person calls sobbing on the phone or screaming on the phone or saying, I'm going to die or, or I mean, because they do get they can get right to that extreme and you have to say, I'm terribly sorry. If you feel that ill, call nine one one. But I'm terribly sorry. I'm about to walk out the door to an important meeting to whatever lie. It doesn't matter. But you have to say no. I cannot come over. I cannot be there right now today. I can be there maybe next week and I'll give you a ring. And you will hang up the phone and you will feel so guilty and so terrible. But in the same sense, you will feel triumphant because you have done something for yourself. Yes. So that that kind of circles us really all the way back around to you also talk in your TED Talk about um, reinventing yourself, the second half of life. Call it different things, but we get to a certain age. And, you know, this the, my program is Conversations with Remarkable People Over 50. And we all start to go through this rethinking of our life and our purpose. And, and we know that, you know, we have – we can – we know that, you know, this is kind of like the second half of our life. Hey, you only get two. <laughs> and we're moving into a different place. And a lot of us do struggle with um, uh, having uh, parents that we, we have to take care of or we, uh, we, we start thinking about, you know, uh, retirement for ourselves, possibly because it's rampant out there and not saved a penny for retirement. Um, but and that kind of is a weird problem because if it was such a large problem, how come so many people went wrong? You know, it's not like a you know. Um, but 
reinventing ourselves is a difficult thing. Everyone seems to think it's kind of easy. You know, we have the technology, we have all of these things. I know they, that you offer, if any anyone feels as though they were they've been a victim of or have compassion fatigue I know that you have your your coaching that you do um and uh but what is it that you suggest to people you know in this whole reinvention process of moving into the second half of life um I I do coaching on on both compassion fatigue and um how do you start over how do you you change everything you can do it in a day and and it's it's your mind. It's the way you rewire your mind. And so you think, like I can use myself as an example. Um, I've always wanted to fly an airplane. I was 45, 46 years old. And I decided I was going to fly an airplane. I marched myself down to the airport. And I was surrounded by people in their 20s. And I flew an airplane. And I became a good pilot. And I became, um, a, I can now fly 19 different airplanes. And then I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? And the hardest thing to do is to figure out what you want to do. And sometimes you have to go way back in your mind. What did I want to do when I was 20? What was my dream? Did I have a mad thing? Did something, you know, did I want to be a veterinarian? Did I want, did I want to go back to school? You know, and, and so you go through all these things that you, you have to regurgitate them. What do I love to do? What would I do without getting paid? You know, those kind of questions you ask yourself so that you can start to hone in on what you really love to do. I love riding horses, but then I said, well, how can I make this more exciting? So I'm competing. So I'm competing with younger people doing some very intensive competition in Western discipline. But um, even there, I see two or three people my age, which makes me super happy. And, you know, when we get older, we have to be careful that we don't fall down because when it breaks, it doesn't heal so well. And we have all these things. But you really can't think like that. The brain doesn't know how old your body is. Your mind will dictate what your body does and how it feels. It will dictate your health. So if your mind is active and your mind is excited and you have to put yourself in that state of excitement and healthy fear, fear is good. To be scared of doing something is great. I mean, every time I get on my horse and that cow is in front, I'm like, oh, my God, is this the day I'm going to fall off and break my neck? So what? I'll be doing something so, I love, you know? <laughs> so, do you, Julia, do you do, like, lassoing and all of that? No, like I do not do roping. Um, I am not a very good aimer. <laughs> but I do everything else. Um, is, if anyone, uh, any of your listeners have ever watched uh, Raining Cow Horse and um, all that kind, it's it's basically it's a very good discipline. You you what they have done over the years is back in the old days, uh, cowboys used to work on a ranch, and there's working cows, cutting cows, um, riding around, you know, checking everything. So what they did was you know, once turned to the other and said, hey, I bet my horse can cut a cow quicker than yours. And that now has evolved into national championships of all the work you do on a ranch is now a competition. And it's really exciting. But I'm 60, almost 68 years old, you know, and I have to, I have to put aside any fear and anxiety and just go out there and do it. And some, yeah, yeah. But as far as other people are concerned, bravery, be brave. I know, but it's not so easy to be brave. So so what's one suggestion you might have on mustering up that bravery inside of you? Because fear is a very deep emotion. Yes. Don't listen to the naysayers. Anytime, when you tell somebody and you're absolutely excited, you've just found out what you want to do and you're going to do this, you're going to go and, oh, I don't know, I, I mean, fly an airplane. You're going to go and, and ride a horse. Even just jump yeah. out of an airplane. You, you know? can jump out of an airplane. You're going to go bungee jumping. You, I mean, all sorts of things that you're, you're excited about. I guarantee you, usually, <laughs> usually people don't like to see other people really, really happy especially if they themselves are not. So you're going to get, oh, yes, but you know, you're going to hurt yourself. Oh, but I don't think, would you really think you should do that? You're going to get the naysayers, the people that put doubt. Don't tell them. And if you're surrounded by people like that, don't tell anybody. Just go do it. Or if you have a 
cup, if you have a couple of people in your circle, you know that you know are going to go, hey, yes, go do it. Good for you. Those are the people you tell. You have to be, you have to pay attention. You have to be very sensitive to all these people that you've known. Are they one of those people? Are they going to put me down? You know, and, and if they are, you don't say a word. In fact, you don't have to tell anybody. You just go do it. And when people say, what are you doing every Saturday? And you go, oh, well, I'm just doing this thing that I'm, I'm enjoying very much. And be strong when they go, you're out of your mind. You go, no, I'm not. I'm very much in my mind, actually, for the first time in my life. Yeah, it's crazy. It's really crazy how other people can, can really, you know, affect your thinking, affect everything that you do. And then at the, at the end of the day, you wake up. You wake up, I'm 63, and I, and I wake up and I say, okay, you know, why am I letting other people affect me? Stop it. Sure. You know, just, it, it, you only have so many, so many tomorrows. You only have so much time left. You know, you have all of this, you know, I think we all feel the same way. We, 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 we spend, the first oh. half of our life is like hunting and gathering, right? We're collecting things. And, you know, we're impressing people or we're impressing ourselves or we're impressing yeah. our children or yes. we're saving for this. And we're, you know, we're going on the vacation that we never go on. And, um, and then we wake up and we, and then we're a little bit angry. It's like, well, wait a minute, where did those, tw- I, can't, I can't tell you how often I hear people say, where did that 20 years go? Where did it go? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I don't feel 60, 68, uh, not at all. My body is, but I, my brain isn't, and, and, and that's what I listen to. You know, I, I listen to my brain. Now, uh, I've had a lot of people uh, that are naysayers, but now they've seen what I've done, and they've seen how I've done it and how I've succeeded at it. They're all like, oh, well, we knew you could do it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> I know you didn't. So it's, it's, you have to, when we listen to someone talking to us, anybody, we will hear the motive and the intention more than we hear the words that they say. So if the intention and the motive behind them saying, oh, well, good for you. And if the intention behind that is not good for you at all, you know, they're not really saying that. You have to be very in tune with that. Listen to the intention. Listen to the motive. Yeah, they uh, than, actually, I think people that are naysayers are they're They're just speaking for themselves like they're never going to do it. So why should you? You know. Sure. Sure. They're terrified. Why, you know, why, why have you got the, the courage that they don't have? I mean, it's, it's a human trait, you know, and, and when we ourselves, maybe, you know, I'm sure you've been there too in our past, we've been in a dark place. I know I have, I couldn't bear to see successful people around me. It made me physically ill. I really wanted to also talk about the anxiety. Okay, so we're mm. in our 50s. Mm. We're going to our second half of life. Maybe you're losing your job. You've been laid off. You haven't. You want to be an entrepreneur. You want to do this. You want to find your purpose. Blah, 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 blah. You, you are searching for yourself. Let's just say that, right? And so we all turn to the thing that is right in front of our faces every day, and we're turning to social media, or we're turning to Instagram. People see I interview quite a few ladies from Instagram. Um, even this morning, I w- I'm like, okay, I have to be on social media in order to, you know, uh, build my audience for the podcast and touch people and be of service to other people. This is this is this is the technology that I need to use. But yet, at the same time, I really have to distance myself emotionally. I almost have to compartmentalize my thinking. There is this this um, social media that has been invented which is basically, I call it the cocaine of this, of this uh, generation. It is, it is, yes, it is, it is a powerful drug. I mean, there you are, you, you post on Facebook everything you did yesterday and including with a picture of the meal you ate and then you get five likes and you're devastated. Then somebody else will post a picture of a swan and two chicks and get 945 likes. And why do they get that and I didn't get, you know what I mean? So you're now starting to validate yourself by a completely unreal, oh, and it's an unreal arena. It's not real. It's, it's, I mean, Instagram is the same thing. Uh, and, and unfortunately, people are using this to validate themselves. I mean, why has suicides in high school children gone up by 44%? Why? You know, bullying happens online now. I, 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 it's frightening. 
if one takes the time to step outside of their demographic or their genre, right? So if I take the time and I go on Instagram and I hashtag and I look at what younger people are looking at or what they're saying, you know, and how they're using social media or Instagram, and then I I jump back to my demographic, which is, you know, this whole surge of people and wonderful people. I Believe me, I'm sure everybody's wonderful people. I'm speaking for myself, but it's so flooded with with people over 50 that are sending great messages. There's some really wonderful things going on. But at the same time, um, personally for me, I, I, I start to feel inferior. I, I do. I, it starts to, to make me feel like, oh, my goodness, they see me in one way, but I know what my life is really. And I'm sure they really know what their life is also, what their real life is. But the superficialness of of what's happening out there. I mean, I'm 63 years old and I have to admit it does affect me. It 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 makes me feel inadequate. Do you know why? It's a very simple thing. Each and each and every human being in the world wants one thing, to be loved, to be appreciated, to be needed, to be to be wanted. That's all humans want. It's a very simple, basic, from the reptilian part of our brain, need. And we have created, because we're humans, we have created a very complicated system to get that. You know, when, when, and if we only realized that, then we would understand there are no bad people. I mean, the person you're dealing with in your life, my mother, all of them, there are only people in pain. And when people are in pain, they behave accordingly. That pain can be dark and black and angry and all of the above, and they will become their own pain. Their pain becomes their story. I mean, how many times have you asked somebody, how are you? And 20 minutes later, you're listening to how they are, and you have just heard the most fantastic story ever about who's doing what and how dreadful. I mean, it's because they hurt, and they don't know how else to get that out other than telling you how much they hurt and how people are betraying them and how people are wrongdoing them. So when we look at it from that perspective, you know, when I, when I have a coaching client who tells me the story of her terrible or his terrible life, I can hear, it's just, I want to be loved. I want to be needed. So we go back to basics. What do you really want? What did you want when you were 15? And, and it's funny when you ask that question, I mean, I often ask the question that that Tony Robbins actually asks a, a lot of the time is, you know, who's when you were young, whose love did you crave most, your mother or your father? And that journey takes you down a whole different road of understanding of the person because it takes them by surprise, you know. So if we can think that way, we, are, we become more compassionate towards other people. And, and I say this as much for myself you know, because um, I can't tolerate fools <laughs> in silence. And, but I have to, I have to try and be understanding and go, how much pain are they in? How much real pain? I don't wake up feeling what they wake up feeling every day. I should be grateful. I should be grateful they're showing me something that I should be grateful for not having. Does that make sense? Yes, because that always kind of goes, that, that goes back to um, everyone is teaching somebody something else. It's like if you what you, what you don't like in the other person yes, is probably what's absolutely. wrong with, with you. Gratitude is one of the most wonderful feelings in the world, and and Maya Angelou always said, you know, you're not living unless you're giving, and when you're giving, the gratitude comes over you that you are able to do that. You're able to give. You're able to be of service. This podcast is of service. You know, we are trying to help all those people out there listening that might go, I f- might go, I feel that. Ooh, I recognize that. And they haven't told anybody because they feel bad about what they feel. Yeah, that that's I, actually, it's kind of funny because uh, I started doing this podcast. This is episode 18. And my intentions uh, going into it were, were basic. It was let's highlight, uh, let's embrace, you know, our age, let's share our wisdom, and let's hi- highlight people who are remarkable over fifty that are can that have shaped our world. Basically, you know, pretty simple stuff. You, know, you find a million of those in Hollywood, <laughs> and uh, 
And and the more and more, I, you know, I, I wasn't into the ageism thing. I wasn't even realizing that there was a whole um, – this whole wave of, of age stuff going on. And now I'm really in the guts of it, right? Because I started to realize, wow, look at this over 50 thing that's happening. And I just kind of wanted to tell stories of, of very cool people that I know, and they happen to be over 50. And, and, you know, and they have a lot of wisdom. But it's really evolved into a, a variety of, of guests that have, I hope, have something for everybody to learn from. Um, I I love having you on as a guest because I feel as though you have such deep deep substance and you're you are you are who you are. You're you're living you're living this life that we're all living. It's not like you're you're 40 and you're telling us over 50 or 60 how to how to go do it, <laughs> how to live. <laughs> Well, no, and 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 I'm not. I mean, I'm I'm there with everybody else. I mean, I have anxious. I have a lot of anxiety. Like, oh my God, I don't really want to do that, you know. And and I go through that a lot. But I think I, I wish this country, I wish this country and England as well, um, respected or uh, revered age more. Every time I see someone with plastic surgery. I think, oh gosh, you don't want to get old. And I understand why. It's no fun. I look in the mirror and said, who the hell put my mother's face on mine? When did that happen? But in Europe, age is revered. You know, grandma lives at home until she passes. There are no nursing homes in some European countries. They just don't exist because age comes wisdom and wisdom is to be revered and respected and learned from in the family. And we don't have that in this country. We're constantly trying to change our face, change our body, you know, to not be. Yes, we're trying to be young again. And and it's it. We're, why? I don't want to be 20 again. Those are the most painful years of my life because I thought I knew everything and I didn't know I knew nothing. Yeah, I'd take 45, though, in a, in a heartbeat. I'd take 40. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I totally my agree. 40s were great. My 40s were. If my you're 40s, out there and you're yeah. listening and you you are in your 40s, yeah. I am telling you. Yes, God yeah. bless you. <laughs> I'm totally with you. I want you to talk a little bit about your coaching. We're going to and, and then tell everybody where to find I mean, I don't this is not going to the psychiatrist needing help thing. This is understanding what you feel what your mind is telling you, what tradition has told you to put your children first, to put everybody else first. And that's boo hickey. Put yourself first because then you can take care of things. You're stronger. You, you weaken yourself every time you put others before you, you weaken your own self. And, and, and once that happens, you're no good much to anybody. So uh, your website is julietwatt.com, and that's Watt with uh, two Ts and Juliet with one L. Yeah, it's J-U-L-I-E-T-T-E, period, Watt, W-A-T-T, uh, dot com. And that's my website, and um, I have a coaching page on there for basically my two areas of of expertise for want of a better word is is compassion fatigue and reinvention but reinvention deeper than you think let's get to the heart of the matter let's really talk about what's really going on you know i'm not going to tell you to run out and and go ballooning i mean i'm going to help you figure out who you really are and maybe who you've lost in yourself by Which is very different um, than, you know, there's there's a lot mm -hmm. of coaching programs out there, and so, but those are career coaching, uh, things like that. This is really your what you offer is really getting down to the core of finding and pursuing what it is what it is in your soul that you you really you want to find it. My problem I have is that I have a hard time finding it because. Uh, I've listened so much to so many people for so long that I got to dig really deep through some, you know, layers. Indeed. To find and, and you're not alone. That's the other very important thing that I want every listener listening to understand. You're not alone. We've all been there. What you're doing is today absolutely right for you. But if you're not happy doing it, if you don't thrive, if you're not thriving doing it, then you have to change and you can change in a day. You change your mind in a day. I had a, I had a, just a quick story. I had a client who called me up with a horrendous story. It was absolutely awful. And uh, I'm pretty direct. I mean, I don't want you 
to, I don't want to mamby pamby you and sympathize with you. Yes, I will be empathetic, but let's get down to fixing, you know? And uh, to cut a long story short, in uh, four sessions, she had completely changed her life. She had gotten rid of her business. She was going to go travel to Thailand. She, I mean, it was incredible. And yeah. I heard on the phone a woman 20 years younger than I'd heard weeks beforehand. And I felt wonderful. I mean, I just, that piece of service that I gave, honestly, Wendy, there is no better feeling than giving. Well, it sounds, Not, it sounds, it's funny, yes. it's funny because <laughs> giving, giving kind of goes right along with being compassionate. So you, you, you have to define the lines on, on the, the type of compassion that makes you feel that way as opposed to the compassion that makes you feel drained and used and, and manipulated. Um, well, this has been awesome, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you today. very, very much. This has been wonderfully enjoyable, and I hope we've helped some folk out there just to, you know, realize some things. Hey, thanks for listening. Please leave me a review wherever you downloaded this podcast, and subscribe. Always subscribe. If you have an event coming up and would like to book me as a speaker, please visit wendycooper.com where you can find out more about me, my services, and leave a suggestion for the a topic or for a guest. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you shared it with a friend. You can follow me on Facebook and on Instagram at C-Spot Talk. That is the letter C, Spot Talk. You can find a complete bio on LinkedIn, and you can enjoy lots of videos on my YouTube channel. There's some pretty funny videos there, as well as past episodes of this podcast. Again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.